Hello, everyone. This is super awesome. This is a super awesome crowd. We're really excited to be here. Um, I'm Kevin Bolin. This is Bill Rudolph. We're from Skywalker Sound. Some of you may not know that in addition to being a post-production sound facility, Skywalker Sound has been working in interactive audio for the last few years, especially for interactive VR. So we're really excited to give you a little bit of a glimpse into three of our recent projects. At any time, if questions or insights or like brilliant ideas come to your mind, just like yell them out. We'd love this to be like, you know, very interactive and organic because we're going to kind of try to give you a crash course on three projects and then give you some time for Q and A so we can just like nerd out on whatever y'all want to hear. So let's get to it. Um, so yeah, uh, Bill Rudolph, Paul Stoughton, and I—we all started in AAA games at EA Visceral Shores. Um, Worked on Dead Space, Visual Dante's Studios Inferno. At, at Shore. There you go. Um, EARS was the acronym. That's all that matters. Um, so we grew from a little small team to a fairly large team right now. So our interactive sound crew uh, is everybody you see up here. It's me and Bill. Uh, Andy Martin who's here in the room, who some of you may know. Um, we've had the opportunity to work on some of our projects with fantastic composers like Wilbert Roger, who you may see right back there as well. Um, and so yeah, we've been doing things, Star Wars, uh, other feature film tie-ins into virtual reality and these other immersive platforms. But honestly, like our current technical and creative experience right now spans everything from mobile games to immersive VR to location-based experiences to theme parks. It's like a little bit of everything. So it's film sound, game audio, location-based sound, um, all of these different things. And WISE is just one of the many tools that we use uh, to execute on our projects. Some of you may be familiar with the character of Darth Vader, Dark Lord of the Sith. He's kind of important uh, in certain universes. Um, currently, we're working on Vader Immortal, which is an episodic narrative interactive VR experience. And in case you haven't seen it, has finally found his candidate. And our future is in your hands. Vida is here. You are the one I've been searching for. Do as I command. Is there any version of this plan that doesn't end up with us being dead? That's easy applause. We should Star Wars. <laughs> um, but I do have to say the really cool thing about that trailer is we actually cut and mix the whole thing, and so most of the sound effects in that are actually like gameplay assets. So unlike a lot of trailers that you may see that are like cinematic trailers, we actually did pull the sounds that Paul Stoughton and I and Bill and like everybody had created for the project themselves. Um, because we work at Skywalker Sound, upholding that sort of like cinematic fidelity in our sound assets all the way through the pipeline is really important to us. And so that's something that you know we've been able to do for Vader Immortal and the other experiences that we've worked on. Obviously, there's a big challenge working in a familiar universe like Star Wars. We're adapting a very familiar soundscape that everyone's familiar with in the films and the other games to this new immersive interactive VR medium. Um, and that includes everything from you know, starting in a, a starship and descending 
through the atmosphere to the fiery planet of Mustafar, um, true, you know, new companion characters that are new and unique specifically for I our IP that takes place within the Star Wars universe, but at the same time they have to feel familiar like these characters that you may have already, you know, known. Um, Z-O-E-3 or Zoe to her friends uh, is voiced by Maya Rudolph. It was really important for us when we were creating this experience that her character maintained the dynamic range and the energy of her personality, but at the same time sounded like a familiar droid. So of course we tried all of the sort of like traditional vo droid vocal processing settings from C-3PO, obviously K-2SO, these other characters, and it turns out that none of those quite fit the tone of her voice and the presentation in VR, and what we ended up settling on was something more similar to um, L3 from Solo which I don't know if any of you guys have sort of paid particular attention to droid processing and sort of, sort of a short delay flanger, it's more of like a harmonizer effect. And so after many, 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 many iterations of batch processing dialogue assets and Pro Tools and ingesting into the audio engine, we settled on just fiddling with plugin settings and whys until we found something that worked for everyone. So it turns out we found a really awesome setting in the harmonizer and then we just rendered that into our audio assets so that that doesn't take up any real time processing. Yeah, and then every time we change dialogue we get those changes for free. It's awesome. Um, but it's really cool because then when I check with Tim Nielsen who developed the droid processing for Ellie on Solo and he's like, yeah, I think I used like a, you know, H3000 harmonizer setting and it was probably like, you know, an up and a down and it's like, okay, great, that's, that's what I did. Cool, so we're consistent, it's awesome, it's canon, it's authentic. Um, <laughs> but it's really awesome that we were actually able to do that and do all of the experimentation and the iteration eventually in, in WISE, like in the audio engine and sort of, sort of like offline and, you know, Pro Tools or even in analog gear as the filmmakers, you know, and the film sound design teams would have done on um, previous Star Wars movies. But we come up with a processing that sounds appropriate for the character. Um, so in addition to a feature film's worth of narrative content, Vader Immortal also features a really robust lightsaber dojo combat simulator. Has anyone had an opportunity to play the lightsaber dojo? You don't care, yeah. maybe. <laughs> um, it is a great workout. So if you love Star Wars <laughs> and want to get into shape, um, it's pretty intense. So you feature wave after wave after wave of enemies that you were introduced to in the story mode as well as new and unique enemies specifically for dojo combat. Um, in episode two, we introduce cool things like traps where you can use the force to activate these levers in the background, which really adds to the complexity of the environmental audio. You can throw your saber. And you can throw your saber, which is pretty awesome, um, to uh, destroy and impale enemies. Um, one of the coolest things about the lightsaber dojo that I absolutely have to say is that our supervising sound designer, Paul Stoughton, is able to get through most of the rounds with his eyes closed because he's paid so much specific attention to the behaviors and the vocalizations and the combat tells of all of these characters that you can tell where they are in position around you and even if your eyes are closed, know when they're about to attack you and because of all, they're all of their behaviors and their vocalizations are fairly consistent and understandable, you get a sense of how much time you actually have. And so you find yourself getting into these interesting cadences of like, okay, I've got some enemies approaching and I know I can trigger this trap and I can trigger this trap and then I can throw my saber and I don't have enough time to get my saber back and then impeel, you know, impale this enemy and I can use the force. Oh yeah, because you can use the force in this. Uh, you know, to like, yes. Um, <laughs> But it's really cool because you start to figure out the patterns of the sounds and the positioning of the sounds, and yeah, you can actually like be a Jedi with your eyes closed. Yeah, which, and, you know, when these Star Wars things are working the way that they intend, it really is like a crazy wish fulfillment exercise. And you know, if you know the movies and you know a little bit about Jedi training, being able to do these things with your eyes closed and actually, you know, do it at a high level, um, given enough uh, practice, uh, I mean, it really speaks to the fiction. And I think it's, it's amazing. You know, for, for me, it's my single piece of space audio that's out there right now, so I really do encourage you to go and check it out. Um, but yeah, it's just amazing that you know, audio can extend the experience in that way for people who are true fans. You know, because yeah, as an audio-only experience, it, it absolutely plays very, very well. And we also do have to say that um, for the dynamic saber system that Paul has developed for Vader Immortal, not only do, does it have to work for the saber that you get in the story mode and the proto saber that you get in episode two, 
but you can actually unlock a lot of favorite classic sabers from all of the films. And so as you get different character sabers, different hilts, different color blades, all of them update their dynamic spatial audio systems to reflect the intended sound of those sabers. And so we've spent a lot of time going through all of the material that's available and generating new material to make sure that when you have the saber and you swing it around and swing it in all directions and attack your enemies, that all of those unique sounds are as specific as possible for that saber, yet feel consistent with the saber behavior and uh, are totally expected, even though they're unique to, you know, whether you've got, you know, a yellow saber or a blue saber or a green saber or a purple saber. Um, so yes, we've shipped episodes one and two. We're currently working on episode three. Um, this has really been a fantastic piece of really like narrative driven VR for us. Um, and it's exciting, it's available on multiple platforms, the Oculus Rift, the Oculus Quest, the Oculus Rift S. Um, but in addition to these sort of like single player, really story driven cinematic VR experiences, um, we also have been experimenting with some sort of more fun co-op experiences. So Ralph Breaks VR is an experience that we did with ILMX Lab and The Void. So in contrast with Vader Immortal, which is a single player experience that you're sort of playing alone at home, Ralph Breaks VR, you got to your local Void location with three of your friends or family, and you're actually, a, it's, it's a whole body, fully immersive experience with you and your friends and family physically inside of the action. It's a four player co-op location based, based VR experience. Um, and what we mean by you're physically inside the action is that when you go to the void, you're actually inside a physical set that is built out with um, 4D sense effects like scent and smell and mist and wind and heat. Uh, in addition to the headphones that you have on your head and the haptic vests with multi, multiple zones of transducers in your vest, we have four transducers. So instead of subwoofers, we're actually physically exciting different arrays underneath the floor, depending on the different rooms that you're in, the different types of effects that you might be experiencing. Um, but the cool thing is, is that even though we're using all of these new technologies to sort of like transport you to this magical place, at the same time, we're being very faithful to the film world that's already been established. So in Ralph Breaks the Internet, you know, Disney Animation and Skywalker Sound built this very unique vision of what the internet is like for Ralph and Vanellope and their friends. And so we had to figure out a way to, to work with the post-production teams in order to bring the internet into VR. Um, so a couple of cool things that we were able to do, we worked with John Rush and his Foley team. So they, were, they walked Foley for the film. We we're able to work with John and have them do Foley performances sync to picture for all of our scripted events and cinematic animations so that the exact same types of sounds that they would have done for the feature film are being done specifically for our interactive game experience. And then we're able to like cut up that Foley and tag it to animations and spatialize it, get it synced with Bill's you know, floor transducer effects. So in that first scene of the experience when like Ralph is like over there and then he like runs up to you and Ralph is, you know, eight, nine feet Ralph tall. Ralph is a really big guy. He's huge. And so you get this really awesome slappy like heel toe Foley because, you know, he's barefoot and he's plot, walking plot, on plot, these plot, plot. surfaces. But it's also like, you know, amplified by these, yeah. you know, floor transducer effects. Yeah, when we got the floor synchronized with the Foley, um, all of a sudden Ralph was in the space with you. And it was really amazing because you've got a living, breathing cartoon character. You know, and the brain is convinced that, uh, that uh, you know, he's actually really there. Yeah, and for those of you who maybe haven't experienced it, um, gaze tracking in VR is super awesome. So when a character at human scale or bigger, like, walks up to you and, like, looks in your eyes and makes eye contact, like, that's absolutely amazing. And then when they actually, like, address you like you're there, sometimes you find yourself, like, responding to them, like, talking back. I often find myself, like, waving, like, oh, bye, see you later. Um, because you really do have that sense of presence and embodiment, like you're there in the room with them. Um, so in addition to working with the Foley, um, we were granted access to the final Pro Tools mixes for the sound effects and Foley from the feature film. So they mixed in Dolby Atmos and Pro Tools. And so literally I was able to go through all the reels of the film and say, okay, those sound effects represent this environment that we're gonna go into. This is how we're gonna split out those Atmos beds and objects. And this is how we're gonna implement it in the game engine. Um, in Ralph Breaks VR, we took kind of a, I don't know, all-encompassing all approach to how we implemented the audio. So 
we have traditional multi-channel beds, we have ambisonic beds, we have pre-rendered binaural beds, we have uh, individual you know, sound objects that are actually spatialized in place, and like this is like just for the environmental sounds. And then once we started getting into all of like the character sounds and the hard sound effects for all of the gameplay mechanics, you know, we were able to take anything from the feature film that applied to our experience and use it as the sort of like baseline foundation of like, okay, now we're gonna live in this cinematic film world, but we also are going to put you inside it. You know? So whereas before you've only ever sort of seen it on the screen, and maybe by the magic of Dolby Atmos, the world, the persistence of the soundscape has been pulled back into the room around you, you are actually inside the action with Ralph and Vanellope and all of their friends. And so once we establish that you're in this like super awesome, familiar cinematic film world that maybe you've seen in theaters with your friends and family, we like totally flip the script and we throw you into like arcade chaos mayhem. Which is called Dunderdome. And uh, I'll speak about Dunderdome as this competitive game that uh, Ralph learns about and he wants to take you to this special place in the internet and he's not really giving you all the details. And it turns out that this special place with this wonderful game is this retro um, arena where you, you know, the, the experience is a four player cooperative experience, but we split you into two groups of two and you each get your own little tower and you can sort of see over there uh, the large canyon that they have. Uh, and the, the game experience itself is a total smorgasbord of uh, you know, all the retro things you can imagine. I mean, in this shot, you, know, you could see some space invaders and you could see some battle zone here with the tanks and it's sort of Tron-like in general. And so, you know, as you can imagine, um, you know, it was a combination of a lot of techniques to get all the content for this. Um, you know, we couldn't just go and sample the video games that wouldn't be appropriate and probably wouldn't be legal. Uh, so, you know, combinations of uh, synthesis, modular synthesis, um, sample manipulation, uh, you know, all sorts of stuff. Um, we ended up with a, with a pretty interesting uh, collection of sound effects and then you put them all in there and try to get them to play together and it tends to be a little bit chaotic. Um, but thankfully, this particular scene builds up to a crazy chaotic climax where you actually end up breaking the machine. And so as we found, as we you know, highlighted more and more objects and more and more stuff became spatialized and you know, we're using binaural techniques, we're using ambisonic techniques, we're using 3D panning, um, sort of the chaos and clutter um, benefited the scene. And by the time you hit that peak, it is really a cacophony um, that's kind of hitting you on all senses. You know, we're hitting the floor transducers as well like Kevin brought up, you know, in the void platform, we have those transducers everywhere. And that's a huge advantage that we have uh, to sell size and weight. Um, and of course, in addition to all of the, you know, kind of classic 8-bit vibey sounds that we put in, um, you know, that cannon has to have size and weight. So there's metal layers in there and, uh, you know, some of the stuff that you would expect if that cannon exists in the real world. But the real challenge is, of course, finding that balance between elements that you still feel like you're in kind of a classic video game, but it's believable as reality. You know, and a lot of time that's, that's one of the challenges, one of the biggest challenges I find in a designer on these experiences is that, you know, when people come in, um, you know, particularly with Star Wars, it's like, you know, they expect it to sound like the Star Wars movies that they've seen. They expect it to sound like the Star Wars video games that they've played. And they expect it to sound real because they're in VR. Um, and that can be a real challenge. And that's a challenge that we address generally on sort of an object by object basis. You know, you've got to look at something, figure out how it's going to play, see if you can guess sort of what the expectation of your audience is, and then kind of balance those elements appropriately so that something is believable. And so Dunderdome was a challenge in some ways, but again, like, uh, it all kind of ended up working out because that chaos is really, it was really brilliant when it hits that peak. So um, one, of the, one of the fun things we got to do in Ralph Breaks VR is that there is a, a uh, popular moment from one of the very early teaser trailers where there's a little girl in a car and her mom's not really paying attention to her so she's playing some game on her tablet and it's, there's a bunny and a rabbit and one of them gets pancakes, one of them gets milkshakes. So the, the Kitty. Kitties, kitties, sorry. So the kitties get the milkshakes and the bunnies get the pancakes and uh, you know... Um, Ralph tries to help. Ralph gets involved and uh, tries to speed up the game a little bit and I don't know if you've seen the trailer, but by the end of the trailer, the, the bunny has ballooned to about 10 times in size and he ends up exploding, which happens off screen and the little girl is screaming and the mom can't figure out why and end of hilarious trailer. And so that moment was a fan favorite, um, but you know, of course that, that didn't actually make it into the film, um, but it was something that we knew about and uh, something that they wanted to incorporate into the experience. And so, you know, sometimes um, these, these, uh, these, 
sort of extensions of the, the franchise, if you will, give us an opportunity to take some of those ideas uh, and expand on them. You know, what was once just a few frames of film uh, becomes a whole interacting, interactive shooting gallery experience where poor Ralph is trapped up in the ceiling off screen. You can't really see him there, but he's suspended by some cables. And then the bunnies and the kitties are uh, pelting us with, um, what is it, a cupcake and a milkshake. And, uh, you know, it's a really fun sort of a shooting gallery experience that the guests get to have.